Hey guys, this is Jacolia of Jacolia Gems. Welcome back home, family. Now, if you happen to be here for the very first time, I do hope that you hear something that will persuade you not only to subscribe, but to join the conversation as well as to share information. With that being said, I'm going to jump straight into today's video, and this will be a part three on making some connections between Bantu West Africans who are known Israelites in comparison to Native Americans whom some suppose are the lost tribes of Israel. Now, you know, all Native Americans are not. We have already talked about some whom are proven to be Edomites. And I have also brought in some similarities that can possibly point to some of these Native Americans before even mixing with these Bantu to be Israelites. Now, I have already talked about the Arawak and the Taino as well as the Kali Nango people in comparison to the Yoruba, the Akan, and the Igbo of West Africa. We've already made linguistics, similarities, form of worship, polygamous systems, and so many more things as far as how they worship and the patriarchy and just so many similarities amongst these people groups. Now, today I want to continue to talk about Mexico, the Caribbean, and some more of these people. I began to share just a little bit in the previous video. I talked about the Carib people and I began to speak about the Garifuna who branched off from the Carib. I want to begin to lean into some linguistics as well to explain a few things across the board. It's important to know that the word Carib in itself means black. So the fact that they begin to name the Garifuna, the Black Carib, becomes very redundant. When we begin to look at the Garifuna people, they practice the Rastafarian religion, and we're going to begin to look into the, the hows and whys. Now, we already made the connections between the key Congo people of West Africa and the Kali Nango people of the Caribbean. We even began to state how Key Congo was actually pronounced Mexi Congo, a Moxie Congo. And I already told y'all, it's definitely not a reach. So on today, of course, I have my notebook because this is a nice amount of um it's a nice amount of information. Now, we know that when you look over into Mexico, the Caribbean period, but specifically Mexico, the caste system looks one way when it's really another. And we're going to begin to explain the caste system and just so many more connections. Now, it's important to know that Afro-Mexicans are actually called Mas Congo. Mas Congo, and this is because a lot of them originated um, from Cape Verde and Guyana and Angola. And so it is stated that when the slaves came into Mexico, that they came from Aragon, and this is in Mauritania. Now, who was in Mauritania? The Israelites and the Moors. These are known facts. We have to stick to historical facts over feelings. Now, later on in the 16th century, black slaves began to come from Bran or Brim. Remember, you guys, when I began to say that the Igbo, who are known Gadites of West Africa, when they came in contact with the Taino in Barbados, they began to use a saying, saying Brim, meaning my people, my kindred, my home. So these are the Bari, the, the um, Biafara people. These are also Igbos. And Brim is in southern Ghana. And it's really important to know that the way that Africa is broken up today 
it's not how it was um before and the language of these people was heavily influenced by man dinka so there is a correlation between igbo and mandinka and we know or well, we're learning that the mandinka were very very present in the mali empire and the mali empire are known to be part of the Solomon dynasty so we're already making some connections to the moors and the israelites as is now you guys we already know that mandinka is one of the tribes that they have thrown around when it comes to the movie roots and just making you think that all africans are mandinkas and afro-americans have begun to use this term to even describe west african people the the mandinka were known to be farmers and when I was looking into my grandfather, um, Jameson, who's from Montserrat, from the West Indies, I began to wonder because he was a farmer. His parents were farmers. I'm like, man, is he Mandinka? But then looking at his name, Jameson, that's Ireland. And then knowing that in Montserrat, they had Sephardic Jews from Ireland taken to Virginia forcibly, then pushed into Montserrat, and they began to mix with these Mandinka. And there were also Akan amongst them from being Ghana, and we know that the Akan and the Igbo were together, so we are all consistently lining this up. And this, these are the people that went into Moxie, Congo. Now, um, when we began to look there was an agreement between the Spanish and the Crown called Asiento, meaning loan, Asiento de Negros, Agreement of the Blacks. And this was basically saying that they were agreeing to sell the Blacks as merchandise. And when we begin to look at the Diola or Yola, D-Y-O-L-A or Y-O-L-A. This is also another name for the Igbo. But it is no coincidence that the Gela, which is very similar um, linguistically, means pay back. I think that that's something important. The slaves that were brought to Mexico were split into two different systems. Now, the first were called the Rantintos, also called Swarthy. Y'all, the word Swarthy literally just means black. If you see somebody with the last name Swartz, or, and even if they appear to be a European, they are a Swarthy European. And at their core, they are really a Moor or a hidden Jew. The same thing with the last name White, the last name Blanc, the last name Moor. Like, it is so many Huguenot Moorish names as well as Hebraic um, and Arabic names that have become, um, when we went into these different places, we began to Europeanize our last names and, and make it into a European version or a Latino version. You see this with um, Lopez and Colon and all of all of these different um, derivations of Hebrew names. And there's also similarities between these languages. And when I began to do another video on my grandfather, Leonard Holiday, and finding out what tribe the holidays were from. We're going to begin to line all of these up. So when you begin to hear the word rantitos, it means swarthy. So when you hear the word swarthy Europeans and you're doing your scholarship, I want you to remember that this word means black. And these people came from the Sudan and the Guyana coast. It's very important to know that the Sudan literally means the land of black. Carib means black. So many things means black. So the second word, and remember this, this, this is important. The second word that they were called was amalados and amaritos, meaning yellow. This was towards the ones that were yellow or in 
complexion. Um, now in the caste system, blacks classified with the Republic of the Spaniards with European swarthy, um, Africans a mixed race separately from the Indos in the caste system. And so Negra Griola is a term used to describe an enslaved woman in Mexico. Meaning that this was a per person that was born in a Spanish or French colony. And Criola comes from the Portuguese cognate Griola. And the verb uh, means to breed or to raise according to a Mexican anthropologist by the name of Gonzalo um, Barban. Criola originally meant the ones that was born and raised up, sprout out from where they were um, born at. So we're gonna get into the talking about the runaways. And the reason we are going to go into this is because this is going to further tie and prove the, the Moorish and Jewish origin of these people that were already here before some of our ancestors was forcibly brought over in the transatlantic slave trade. We're going to make the connections. The word maroon and marano, moreno, these were words used to describe the conversos, the Jews, the Israelites, who were forcibly converted in England, in Spain, in Portugal, in France, in Germany, in all of these places, they became conversos. And a lot of times the Israelites who would not conform were expelled and the only ones that were allowed to stay were conversos or coverts. The ones who actually converted to Catholicism or the ones who pretended to convert and outwardly were Catholic, but practiced the Jews' religion at home. And when you begin to look at the Arabic and the Spanish definition of maroon, marano, moreno, it means swine, it means pig. And this begins to take us to the Hamosinian dynasty and the reason that this is important and i've talked about this in another video is because when we begin to look into the greco-roman captivity that the israelites were experiencing under antioch um antiochus epiphanes the fourth when he was in rule even when they were going to war with alexander the great so on and so forth and the greco-romans and they came in and they subjugated our people and force them to worship Zeus. This is when the desolation abomination began to take place because they came in and they erected not only a statue to Zeus in the temple, they also dedicated a pig on the altar. And we began to look at the Levitical laws. We began to see that according to the dietary laws, that pig is unclean. And even scientifically speaking, the pig is a vacuum cleaner for the earth. It has no sweat glands. It will eat literally anything. And when we eat that which is unclean, we begin to inhabit the spirits that's on the inside of that. This begins to even take us, um, in the book of Isaiah, it begins to say, that when Mashiach comes on the scene, that those who are found eating the mouse and the abomination will be. In the um, Greek New Testament, we see where Yeshua bar Yosef came into spiritual warfare. And this is why diagnosis is important, not to begin to claim the spirit, but to identify the spirits, to call out by name as he did. He began to call out, call out, it wasn't working. What is your name? We are legion 
and legion in um in 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 the roman army is at least a thousand so it's at least a thousand spirits and it says what have we to do with you we haven't been bothering you the spirit recognized the spirit and they ask to go into the herd of pigs. And the herd of pigs began to inhabit the spirits. And they went into the water. Our people always knew about what went on under the water. And I'm going to take those old videos that I did on Aquaman and the Marine Kingdom and break them down. So we knew that the forceful conversion made us unclean. And we knew that the Greco people came in and made our, our 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 altars unclean and made us unclean by forcibly converting us and so this is an identification marker that has been seen for us throughout all of these ages but we also see the Hamiltonian dynasty where the Maccabees Judas the Maccabees they were living autonomously just as we did in Goshen just as my grandfather Leonard Holiday had us doing in London in Mooresville just as in Mount Bayou, Mississippi, to begin to live away from. But the maroon became known as being runaways, being fighters, because they had to be forced to be converted. When we began to look at the runaways in Veracruz, they created settlements called Palinques. They this and 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 these runaways led us to the maroons. Maroon is also identified as being wild or untamed. Now, when we begin to look at this, it's questions out there, y'all. Are the maroons Hebrew Edomites or Hebrew Israelites? Because when you begin to look at the description of he, who Esau would be, it said that he would be a wild hunter. And when we begin to look at the etymology of the names and what these people groups are being called. They are being called wild hunters, accurate hunters, and they're being called wild soul. And they're also being described as being red. And we know that Moors are Ishmael, but also Esau as well. So, we, we, we have to do some some dissecting and some, some questioning. Now, there are a group of Maroons in Brazil that are called Galung, Kalungas. K-A-L-U-N-G-A-S. This is clearly related to the Kalinango, which was related to the Kikongo people of West Africa. I remember um, the Kalinango also spoke Pigeonese or Platos. Um, and we see that the Maroons speak this as well as these natives that I'm speaking about now. Now, the Kalunagas um, from Brazil, they are a mix of African and native ancestry. And they're African in, in Zambia. Kalunga means hunter or accurate hunter. And as I just foresaid, this is the same that Kalinango and Kikongo mean as well. So when we begin to look at the um the word Semaran, S-I-M-A-R-A-N, this is a Taino word for wild savage, going astray. We began to look at the Semarons. The Semarons are very, very important. And we're going to talk about the Semarons in just um a little a little bit. Um the, the Semarons, very important to history. So when we begin to look at the Garifuna, the Garifuna were a mix of Arawak and Kalinango and Afro-Caribbean people. Now, we already went through in the previous video saying that Kali means um, the black mother goddess in the Hindu culture. And we know that Nagu goes back to the Nagas people, serpent people, serpent worship, so on and so forth. And so 
in the 18th century, the English began to bring in the difference between the black, the red, and the yellow with the description of these native people. And so um, the French began to develop plantations in 1638. And Louis the Eighth began to authorize the purchase of people from Sub-Saharan Africa to go into Martinique. It's always something about Sub-Saharan Africa. It's very important to know without a shadow of a doubt that the English, the Portuguese, the British, they knew who these Sub-Saharan African groups were before 1619 before the transatlantic slave trade, before the expulsion of the Jews in the 1400s, in the 1100s, they have been going into Sub-Saharan Africa since forever because these are Sephardic Jews and Moors and they would always go into Sub-Saharan Africa where the other branches of the Israelites were. We have to remember that some Israelites stayed in Egypt. We have to remember that some Israelites um, still kept their pre-exilic practices. We have to remember that some Israelites went into West Africa, went into North Africa, East Africa, that we are everywhere. We have been marine people and seafaring people specifically the tribe of dan and we're going to talk about that when i get into that video about my grandfather leonard but the portuguese are known to be the blacker of the sephardic jews and they were in west africa a lot as the english as the british so on and so forth so they already knew what tribes of people did certain crops did certain farming did certain agriculture and so when they began to take these crops and then even go into the Americas and see all of this going on, they knew what people to take where. They set it up strategically because they knew these people. They were doing trades with West Africa, specifically the kingdom of Benin was so important to britain and we see this once again in the hebraic movie um black panther wakanda forever with michael b jordan and we see this in that scene in the museum when you see so many of the dahomey who are known to be the tribe of don and the tribe of don is in so many different places by in in that museum there were skilled divers, there were merchants, there were tailors, there were trumpet players, there were so many royal people. When they began to go into these kingdoms, the Mali kingdom, the, the, they, they saw a lot of royalty and it was not just in africa we had black royalists in europe we colonized europe and britain and india so on and so forth and these are just facts um whew. okay so the gary funa people not only speak gary funa which is an Arawak language, and we've already made the similarities between Arawak language, ancient Phoenician, and ancient Hebrew, but they also speak Creole. Now, it's important to know that Pathos actually goes back to France, uh, meaning that it's a local dialect, clumsy, uncultivated speech. And when we begin to look into the Maroons, the French actually believe um, that the word comes from a word meaning feral or fugitive. It also means reddish brown. And the same word um, comes from the Spanish word meaning slave and runaway. Let that sit. When we begin to look into the Mas Congos or the Afro Mexicans, they are related to the Zambo or Sambu. And those are those who are mixed with African and American Indian ancestry. They're also called Kafuzo or Lobo, meaning wolf. 
this begins to lead me to the fact that in our movies, they often depict the black man as a sambo character who's just running around and making a mockery of himself. But the entire time they are exposing to us the mixture of our West African ancestry and Native American ancestry by giving us these names. It's also synonymous to when they would have the black woman with the headscarf and the red lipstick on and us not realizing that this is a Moore's head right in front of us. The ancient mammy box that they began to make uproar over Jemima is a Hebrew name, the daughter of Job that replaced his other daughter who was known to be one of the most beautiful Edomites that ever did live. They give us our culture and put it right in front of us. So let's begin to continue to have line up on line, precept on precept, here a little, there a little. I truly hope that I shared something on today to make some more Hebraic connections between the West African tribes of um, the Mali Empire, the Mandinka. We talked about the Yoruba, the Akan, in comparison to the Garifuna and the Carib and the Taino and the Arawak and the Kalunga and the Kalinango people in comparison to the Kikongo, the Simaroons and the Zambo. Oh, the reason that the Cimarrones are very important because when you begin to look at the pictures of the Cimarron, they look identical to Black Tudors, Black Moors, the Black uh, Moors. And if we know that the Maroons are Moors, then the Cimarrones are Moors, same people. So when Francis Drake came over and he had Jews, with him and i'm under the belief that francis drake was a hidden one as well given the fact that he was part of the east indian company the same company that my grandfather leonard holiday helped found the same company that was started by 125 merchants who were known to be I iberian sephardic jews the same company that were freemasons when we begin to look into the biblical narrative, King Solomon was the first who was able to successfully build naval ships that lasted. When we begin to look into the fact that the East Indian Company had 260,000 soldiers that was bigger than the British Army, which is how they were able to take over Britain, India, Hong Kong, China, the Indian Ocean. The fact that Masons began to build their beliefs off of Solomon's temple. The fact that these Sephardic Jews are the ones who are known to be the merchants, known to be the sellers. So when Francis Drake came over here, just like when Christopher Columbus came over here, why everybody coming over here with a whole bunch of Jews, a whole bunch of Africans on the boat, but they white? Come on, y'all. Y'all know what time it is. It's time to wake up. We have to begin to tell the truth about this history. And then I even began to um, look into the fact that one of the black Jews who he had on a boat with him told him, told him I'll, I'll talk to these Cimarrones for you because we have to remember that there's a difference between Latino, which is the Hispanic form of Hebrew, and Bantu. Bantu is going to be more closely related to the roots of ancient Hebrew because those who stayed in West Africa was able to hold on to the purity of the language even more because they were not colonized at a higher rate as those who were in Spain and Britain and so on and so forth and even those of us that are in diaspora who don't even know our language anymore. So he told them, you know, these Cimarrones knew where the Spanish ships was going because they left Peru with some gold. These were pirates, you guys. These were the true pirates of the Keter, the Moors, and the Sephardic Jews. So the Cimarrones 
began to help Francis Drake defeat the Spanish. Francis Drake and the rest of these people were Protestants. The Spanish were the ones who were enforcing Catholicism. We got to read. Line up on line and precept on precept. Here a little, there a little. You know, like I said. So, there are some correlations between all of these people. This is honestly just the Bible unfolding. History repeating itself. A whole bunch of Hebrews going to war with one another. Gentiles going in, coming in, minding our business, subjugating us. We practicing indentured servitude. They come in making things way worse than it's supposed to be and you know, forcing their religions and all of these other things. We trading money and all of this. So yeah, this is Jacolia of Jacolia Gems. I'm signing off. <clears throat> Food for thought.